This video is brought to you by Manscaped. Stick around to hear more about the special offer they are providing to the entire Upper Echelon community. Also, side note, they have been amazing to work with on a compressed timeline this month in particular, so genuinely, thank you Manscaped for being an excellent partner of the channel. Okay, today I want to examine the evolution of microtransactions because the notoriously controversial monetization model of video games is now infecting other industries. It all starts with horse armor. For some, those words mean absolutely nothing. Horse armor, what even is that? But for others, it is a flashpoint where the downward spiral of in-game monetization, also known as microtransactions, first began. Horse armor was a product of Bethesda, Bethesda being a once glorified game studio responsible for household names such as The Elder Scrolls and Fallout. Horse armor was exactly what it sounds like. Armor for a horse in a video game, but unlike in-game items before it, horse armor was a purchasable micro DLC, downloadable content package, that could be bought by players independent from their actual purchase of the game. This concept was met with near instant and widespread animosity, but optics aside, it was financially successful. Players paid money for this cosmetic item, and the concept of microtransactions was born. Now, before someone says this in the comment section, in reality this was not the first ever chronicled example of a microtransaction. There were arcade games in 1990, such as Double Dragon, where coins could be used to buy specific individual power-ups, technically fulfilling the modern definition of a microtransaction, as well as the premise of L in Second Life, and various other titles, particularly in the South Korean market, most of all. But Horse Armor was a widespread, high-profile example that gained international attention when it modified the purchasing structure for in-game items of a major video game franchise. From here, predatory monetization exploded. I've done a more in-depth historical analysis of precisely how and why these trends developed in the past, but for today I'll simply boil it down to critical events. After Horse Armor came Online Passes, an early stage of the now popular Season Pass or Battle Pass concept. These were pioneered initially by Electronic Arts, who would go on to become one of the most prolific microtransaction abusers in the entire industry. As the concept spread and infected other companies in the industry, an even more insidious creation was eventually born. Loot Boxes. Pioneered also by Electronic Arts for use in their FIFA Ultimate Team franchise mode, loot boxes were unregulated gambling with no age restriction. These were technically microtransactions with an added flavor of addictive properties, and over time these began to appear in all corners of the industry, from multiplayer to single player to mobile games and beyond. Now, in tandem with this was one more important concept called on-disc DLC. DLC, downloadable content, was already somewhat controversial in some circles, but by and large customers had come to accept it. What they had not come to accept was on-disc DLC, which can be described as a piece of content that already existed and was fully functional within the product that you initially bought, but would require additional payment just to access it. Capcom was a notorious example of this concept in the early days, and a fierce debate began to emerge about the ethical pitfalls of this practice. Over time, regulations began to emerge aimed at curbing the addictive and predatory nature of loot boxes in particular. On-disc DLC became a less common practice, but certain other measures like battle passes, season passes, and general microtransactions became integrated into the very foundation of the industry. Suffice it to say, these basic ideas, the conceptual methods of extracting maximum revenue from your customer base that had infected gaming, were here to stay. Before going further, here's another segment about Manscaped. Men's hygiene and grooming has come a long way in the past couple of years, with no better example than the Platinum Package 4.0. On a personal note, I use all of these products myself. The boxer briefs are the first ones I grab after a clean wash. The shampoo and conditioner, I never thought I would use conditioner, but here we are, come as a two-in-one option, making them easy and convenient to use. They have aluminum-free deodorant, my entire bathroom sink is covered in their products, and of course, the Lawnmower 4.0, cordless electric trimmer with an LED light for convenience, and the Weed Whacker nose hair trimmer. I have nose hairs that grow right out of my nose if I don't get rid of them, so that one in particular, pretty big fan. There's even more, a bunch of products, but tying them all together is the Peak Hygiene Plan, where you get all the refills and product replenishments sent straight to your door. If you want a special discount, as well as two free gifts in the process, the Shed Travel Bag and a pair of anti-chafing boxer briefs, you can use the link down below in the description and code UPPER at checkout for 20% off and free international shipping. Again, link down below and code UPPER at checkout for 20% off, two extra gifts, and free international shipping. Big thank you to Manscaped for sponsoring the channel. Now though, the evolution. It's important here to understand some of this language. Microtransaction, contrary to its literal definition, does not necessarily mean small. The majority of microtransactions in video games are, in fact, small purchases, but not all of them. And when understanding how this mechanism has evolved into the wider industrial landscape, we need to be precise in our understanding. 
Microtransactions, simply put, are smaller pieces of content that you can buy after some sort of initial purchase, but they do not necessarily have to be lower price tags. There are numerous different examples in gaming, but one that stands out in particular is Path of Exile. I love this game, I do, but it has some of the most ridiculously overpriced cosmetic microtransactions imaginable, some even costing in excess of $60 to $80 for a single pack. The game itself is free, and these are not necessary purchases by any stretch, but they are beginning to span the gap between micro and macro. These kinds of pricing models have given rise to the term macro transactions, because the idea is that items being sold within a game for that kind of price tag are no longer small or micro. However, for today's video, despite the ridiculous cost associated with some of these micro transactions, up to nearly $10,000, I will still be referring to them as micro. This is not a claim that the cost is reasonable or small, it's merely a way to classify all of them together as one singular premise. Having established precisely what microtransactions are, let's have a guess at where they go from here. Take a second, everyone watching this, if you want to, go ahead, type out your guess in the comment section, and let's see who gets it right, because I think a lot of people might get it wrong. All set, got a guess, okay good. Microtransactions are infectious, but where do they go next? And the answer? Tesla. How in the world does that make any sense? Well, it's pretty simple. Tesla cars, more than most other cars in the world, are software-based rather than hardware-based. That's not to say that there aren't extensive hardware requirements and restrictions, but over-the-air software updates can have a tremendous amount of impact on, let's say, automated self-driving or even, it turns out, battery function. In 2016, Tesla began to sell in-car purchases, oddly reminiscent of in-app purchases, aka microtransactions, even so far as to allow for users to buy a 25% efficacy boost for their car's battery. This means more range, better performance, and it was just one of many items that they began to sell as microtransaction purchases after you bought the car itself. At one point, Tesla was offering vehicles that had 75 kilowatt hour batteries, but they had software locked them at 60. The reason behind this initial problem is rather complicated in terms of supply and why they were putting those batteries in the first place, but shipping 15 kilowatt hours of unused battery capacity became a microtransaction in a car where you could pay many thousands of dollars to extend the range of a battery that already existed with that performance capability intact in the vehicle that you already bought. Remember on-disc DLC? Yeah, the idea of shipping a product that simply obfuscated some of its actual content or performance, in this case effective power, had affected the automobile industry. The concept of Tesla microtransactions rapidly became a battleground. The same way people jailbreak iPhones, people began to hack into Tesla operating systems and force open these paid performance upgrades out of spite. Acceleration boosts, that was another one, which would have cost about $2,000 for each person, were being hacked and opened for free, creating a tug-of-war scenario between Tesla and disgruntled programmers. Tesla is attempting to bar these kinds of modifications entirely and extract as much revenue as possible by throttling down performance and selling you back the solution. But here's the thing. Once again, the lineage of this problem can be traced back to video games. The phenomenon itself is not new, but a recent and extremely obvious example for today would be Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Odyssey is, in my opinion, a decent game, but one thing that the publisher, Ubisoft, did at launch was offer microtransaction performance boosts such as a permanent 100% experience gain modifier. That's not really uncommon by itself, but when you actually played the game, there would be large amounts of dead progression between major story beats. If you played with a basic version, those dead progression intervals would necessitate grinding or alternate exploration. But as soon as you purchased the universal experience booster, those moments completely evaporated. The game felt, in no uncertain terms, like a base experience had been crafted, a balanced experience, with progression speeds that got cut in half afterwards, only to sell that option right back to you in the store. Over time, they made changes and released fixes, but the concept of throttling in video games was there to stay. Bungie executed a very similar tactic in Destiny 2 with bright engrams for cosmetics. Battlefront 2, a product of EA, would restrict players down to an uncomfortable lack of resources to push them into the microtransaction store. And when we think of Tesla, with a battery that certainly can accelerate quickly or reach a certain range, choosing to implement software blocks that prevent those capabilities from even operating, we can see chilling similarities once again to the most invasive and predatory practices from video games. 
ultimately, Tesla actually lost a lawsuit brought against them by customers because they even went as far, in certain models, I'm not kidding, as throttling the batteries down after the purchase, when they weren't initially throttled, with a software update. Again, the concept of software patches in video games can often mean a stealth nerf or of your favorite build or farming mechanism or character. But for Tesla, software updates can mean a restriction on the literal function of your car's battery and range, just so that they can sell those functions back to you for more money. The most predatory aspects of microtransactions, on-disc DLC, and throttling have made their way to the electric vehicle market. How about another example? BMW. It turns out electric vehicles aren't the only ones. BMW has begun to implement, in certain countries, in-car microtransactions for things like heated seats, heated steering wheels, and everything from high-beam headlamp assistance modules to street parking and traffic information. This presents a series of interesting ethical questions, however, because high-beam headlight assistance, which is the feature where the lights can be auto-turned on and off to prevent blinding other drivers, has at least some relationship to general user safety, and safety for other drivers as well. Safety itself is becoming a microtransaction. Now, less important, but still quite alarming, every single car where these capabilities are being offered will need to come with not just software, but hardware capabilities built in. Sure, the company sells you the option to access those features, and if you don't pay up, you lose them. More on that later. But this is a tremendous waste of resources. Not everyone will actually use those features. Obviously, it is deemed as being more profitable by the company to ship the features and leave them inactive in some or most cases, but we need to genuinely evaluate what kind of effect it will have to start wasting that many resources just to prep, but not use, a wide array of extra car capabilities in all models so that they can be monetized for a slightly increased margin on a per month basis. Vehicles have been infected by microtransactions. Still, we have one more example for today, which is probably the worst example of microtransaction purchasing yet. This is the AI-1 airbag vest. Made for motorcycle users, the vest is created and sold by Climb, I think it's pronounced, with its airbag component through a company called In and Motion. The vest is a $400 product, right? Sounds reasonable, or rather expensive, but that's not actually the real price. Once you buy the vest, you need to buy the actual capabilities of the vest with an AI brain that will activate the product to try and save your life in the event of a crash. This is where we get into very dangerous territory, because you can either pay 400 additional dollars, making it an $800 vest, or $12 a month discounted to $120 per year to have the airbag activated. The psychology behind this is not unique to video games, but it's a practice that has grown and evolved there for well over a decade. The higher universal charge is meant by design to be unappealing. The next method is $12 per month, and as quoted in their official product promo, this is best for riders who will use the vest seasonally, because they can turn it on and off. However, that completely falls apart when you realize that the incentivized deal that they offer is $120 per year, which is effectively two months for free, and that the warranty on the vest, even in the event of a full $400 permanent unlock, is only two years long. This monetization model is designed so that a full year purchase is the most fiscally attractive thing to do. The two year warranty? That is designed to dodge any actual payouts, because rechargeable batteries and other electrical components don't often fail within that time frame. However, rechargeable batteries and electrical components absolutely can and do fail between two and four years. So the idea that the subscription feature is meant for seasonal riders is disproven completely by their incentive to pay monthly or most notably on an annualized schedule. Here's the catch. If you pay monthly or annually and your payment for whatever reason does not go through, let's say your credit card expires over the course of two years or something like that, the airbag eventually stops working and will refuse to save your life. The vest itself is 400, but true activation is another 400. That creates a phenomenon, a well-known psychological phenomenon known as sticker shock. And to remedy this, they sell a subscription where if you stop paying, you might die. In an interview with Motherboard, a sister company to Vice, communications manager at Climb said, quote, when it comes to missing payments and airbag functionality, in and motions payment notifications and 30 day grace period are reasonable. At some point, if a person stops paying for a service, that service has to be suspended, just like your utilities or a cell phone plan, end quote. Safety itself is being manipulated into a monthly subscription or a battle pass of whether or not you live. Cars are being throttled down, restricting the capabilities that they technically have out of the box to sell those features back to you, even restricting them after you've purchased them and have used them for a while, even as far as heated seats, battery life, and high-speed acceleration. 
In a video game, you can sometimes pay extra for a faster car, but that concept is now quite literally real as a result of Tesla microtransactions. The concept that has plagued video games for almost 20 years now is growing. The idea of chopping apart the initial experience and selling it back down to the customer for maximum profit is not conceptually new, but the way we see it now bears alarming similarity to what we saw in gaming just 10 to 12 years ago. If that trend continues, we will be in microtransaction hell, because if the relationship here is any forward-looking indication, it's just now getting started. I hate to see where all this goes, but we're about to see over the next few years regardless, because once it has begun, this kind of industry trend, as evidenced by video games, can rapidly evolve into something unexpected and massively predatory. I hope it doesn't happen here, in other industries, particularly the automobile industry, but we'll see. That's it. If you want to support, there are links down below, primarily Locals and Patreon to get away from AdSense, also another YouTuber to check out, merchandise, social media, also Manscaped, of course. Big thank you to them for being very accommodating this month, actually. I appreciate it a lot, etc., etc. There's other links as well, but I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching, and have a nice night.